but we're talking about resurrecting a good confession. Yes. The enemy accuses you in the same way. He speaks accusations. So when we confess something with our mouth, we are coming into agreement with something, depending on what we confess with our mouth. When we confess the Word of God, we are coming into agreement with the Word of God. But we're talking about resurrecting a good confession, a good confession. And I just want to put some of you at ease right away. We are not going to be talking about confessing your sin. That's not the topic of today. We're going to be talking about the things that we confess with our mouth. The things that we say, and I think uh, it's expected when you go into a topic about what we say as believers that everyone would refer back to Proverbs 18, 21, that death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat of its fruit. And that scripture is absolutely truth. I've taught on it before. Uh, that scripture is valuable to us in our Christian walk, but that's not what I'm focusing on today. What I'm focusing on today is the importance God puts on the words that we speak. The importance that God puts on the words. Let me, let me give you an example of that. Words were so important. How did God create the heavens and the earth? Genesis uh, 1-3, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. God spoke these things into existence. How do you and I come to salvation? If I go to Romans 10, 8 through 10, it says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. How are we told by our Father to communicate with him? We pray. We pray, Ephesians six eighteen, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. In the same way, how do we defeat our enemy? We defeat our enemy with what we speak, what we confess. The enemy accuses you in the same way. He speaks accusations. Revelation 12, 10 through 11. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser, that's Satan, of the brethren has been thrown down to earth, and he accuses them before our God day and night. But he is trying to attack you with accusations, but what's your response? And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even to the, when they faced with death. So how do we overcome the enemy? With the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. In other words, the words and speaking words and what we say is critical in our lives. See, we confess the things that we speak. And when you confess, you are actually doing something in the spiritual realm. Let me show you what I mean. The word we confess in Greek is homologeo, homologeo, and homologeo means, the word we confess means to agree with, to agree with. So when we confess something with our mouth, we are coming into agreement with something, depending on what we confess with our mouth. When we confess the word of God, we are coming into agreement with the word of God. But when we confess what the enemy says about us, we are coming into agreement with what the enemy says about us. Then I confess and I agree that what the enemy said about me is truth and I'm coming into agreement with it. 
So we have to learn to recognize when we are confessing things with our mouths. Are you with me? I'm going to go into a scripture and I'm going to show you exactly how this plays out. I'm going to be in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 19. We're talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist is in jail and they're sending people to him to say, who are you? Who are you? So in John uh, 19, uh, 119, this is the testimony of John. I don't mean to get all concordance on you, but the Greek word for testimony is materia. And materia means speaking as a witness. In other words, this is what I have witnessed, therefore I'm going to speak it. That is my testimony. This is what I've witnessed in Christ. I'm going to testify to what I've witnessed in Christ. From, from the root word matus, which actually means a witness who's willing to die. We get our word martyr from that. I am a martyr willing to die because of what I'm willing to testify. So the testimony of John from John is about Jesus. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask, who are you? Who are you? The Pharisees want to know, why is everybody paying attention to you, John? Why do they think it's important that you're here, John? Who are you, John? Also notice that the Pharisees are asking John, who are you? Why are they asking John, who are you? Because John is an expert on who John is. There is nobody on the planet who knows more about who John is than John. Are you with me? There should be nobody who knows more about who you are than you. You are the expert on you. As a matter of fact, let me just give you some sideline advice. We're about to take a rabbit trail. Rabbit trail goes right over here. The rabbit trail is if you want to be good with people, if you want to be a good conversationalist, you want to be easy to talk to other people, here's how you do it. Ask them questions about them. Why? Because they know the answer to every question you ask them about them. They can tell you they're experts on them. So it doesn't matter what you ask them. They will know their answer to whatever you ask them about them. Are you with me? So it's very easy to talk to someone. Just ask them questions about them. Most people love talking about themselves, but we're not getting into that. So they're asking him who he is because he's the expert on who he is. I don't want you to miss this. John is the expert on who he is. Let's go to verse 20. And he, John, confessed. Everybody say confessed. And he did not deny, watch this, but confessed. The second time, say confessed. Twice John has said confessed, and we know what confessed means. It means I'm coming into agreement with what I'm about to say. Here's the first thing he said. I'm coming to agreement that I am not the Christ. And they ask him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He said, no. So the first thing to recognize from John is John knows who he's not. Uh oh. John knows who he is not. He says, I'm not Jesus. I'm not Elijah. I'm not the prophet. Maybe one of the things we need to learn about ourselves is who we're not. So we don't have to present ourselves as someone other than who we are. Ah. I don't want to step on your toes. Uh, listen, whatever John is about to say, because they ask him in 22, then they said to him, who are you so that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? What do you say about yourself? Man, this is the key for today. What is he going to confess about himself? Because what you say about yourself is critical because whatever you say about yourself, you are coming into agreement with. Mm. Whatever John is about to say is how John says, this is how I'm defined. Whatever John is about to say is this is how I will be known. Whatever John is about to say, he wants you to know this about 
him. And others will walk away with an impression about John based on his confession. Consider if you were asked the same question, who are you? Because most of us say things like, well, I'm a, I'm a husband, uh, I'm, a, I'm a wife, uh, I'm a plumber, uh, I'm a lawyer, uh, you know, I'm a nobody, I'm just an average person. Listen to me, what comes out of our mouth that we confess about ourselves is what we agree with about ourselves. That is huge, huge. So let's see what John does. Verse 23, he, John, said, and man, don't miss this, what he's about to say. When they said, who are you? John says, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. That's how John defines himself. And he goes on to clarify why he's saying that. He says, as prophet Isaiah said, as the prophet Isaiah said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the boom. Here's the problem. The Pharisees know the scripture. They know what the prophets have said. They know what Isaiah said. They know that Isaiah said, there will be one who comes crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Are you ready for this? John responded by confessing that he was what the word of God said he was. What the word of God said he was. That's who John says, I am. I am whatever God says I am. That's what I am. That's who I am. And John agreed with God that I am a voice crying in the wilderness. Do you know who God says you are? Because you can find out who you are in the word of God. You can go back to scripture and find out who you are so that when someone says, who are you? You can give an appropriate response that agrees with God. Mm, John confessed, came into agreement about what God said about who he was. And I don't want you to miss this. From this point forward, in the conversation with John and the Pharisees, John now has words of authority to speak. He has words of true power. He is now speaking the truth of God, and he has the attention of the religious leaders. He's in agreement with God. He's confessing what God said. Now think about the Pharisees for a moment. Here are the Pharisees who are saying, man, everybody seems to be putting importance on this guy. We've got to find out who he is. And then they go and they find out who he is. And what he says is, I'm the one that Isaiah said would come. What does that mean to the Pharisee? What it means to the Pharisees, they got to stop and think and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. In the scripture, God told us, our God told us that a man would be coming. He told us that this man would prepare the way for the Messiah. God told us that this man would be important to us. The Pharisees are now saying that. God told us a man would come crying in the wilderness. Listen, they are no longer messing with John. They are now messing with the word of God. They're messing with God and saying, God told us, and you're saying you're that person. So now they have to accept or reject God. I'm going to let that sit for a minute. Because when you come into agreement with who God says you are, the enemy is no longer messing with you. The enemy is messing with God. That was so much better than you took it. For John and the Pharisees, the supernatural and the natural just came into alignment and agreement. History and their current situation just came into agreement. Prophecy and its fulfillment just came into agreement. The fact that the word of God never returns void was just verified. When John said, I am who God said I am, listen to me, John gained a supernatural authority. Why? Because the Pharisees now had to look at John and say, you're the voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Messiah. 
Now, all of a sudden, he has authority. He is on mission from God. We know he's from God because the scripture said he would come and he is now here. So I got to deal with it. Listen, when we confess that we are who God says we are, we come into agreement with God and gain a supernatural authority. Now, you didn't write it down, so I'm going to say it again. When we confess that we are who God said we are, we come into an agreement with God and we gain a supernatural authority. Listen to me. What would it affect you if you confessed agreement with God that you have power to trample on snakes and scorpions, those demonic forces? What would it make a difference for you if you confessed and came into agreement with God that you could cast out demons, cleanse the leopard, heal the sick, raise the dead? What would it affect you in your life if you confessed that you now know nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Because you see, it's not about who you are or who you say you are. It's about confessing in agreement with who God says you are. I'm going to show you an example. An example from the Bible of people who accepted what God said, even though it didn't look like that's who they were. I'm in the book of Joel. Joel chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. This is what it says. Proclaim, confess, declare, This among the nations, prepare a war, rouse the mighty men, let all the soldiers draw near and let them come up. That would make sense, right? We're going to have a war. Let's get all the soldiers together. Look at 10. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Now, don't miss this next line. Let the weak say, I am a mighty man. You have to stop and ask yourself the question, why is God saying, I need you to confess that you are a mighty man when right there in the same scripture, he said you're weak. I want the weak to say this. I want the weak to confess this. And did you notice what it is they were told to do? They were told to take their plowshares, turn them into swords, and their pruning books into spears. So what is the definition in this scripture of what it means to be weak? It means you're a farmer. They're not soldiers. They're not warriors. They're farmers. And he says, I need you to declare that you are mighty men. I need you to confess with your mouth that you're a mighty man, even though you think you're just a farmer. Turn that plowshare, that pruning hook into weapons, and let's go come into agreement with me that you are mighty. Now, what's going to happen as a result of God saying to them, I need you to take your farm implements and make weapons out of them. All you got to do is go down to verse 18. In verse 18, it says, And in that day, the mountains will drip with sweet wine, and the hills will flow with milk, and all of the brooks of Judah will flow with water, and a spring will go out from the house of the Lord to water the valley of Shittim. Egypt will become a waste and Edom will become a desolate wilderness because of the violence that was done to the sons of Judah and in whose land they have shed innocent blood. But Judah will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem for all generations and I will avenge their blood which I have not avenged for the Lord dwells in Zion. Are you with me? What he just said is you are weak farmers but you're going to turn your instruments into weapons of war. I need you to say, I am a mighty man so that I can take you to battle and the land will become sweet with wine and the flow with milk and water and their enemy will become a wasteland and God will avenge what's happened to them. Why? Because they declared what God said about them. The weak were told to confess, no, I'm not weak. I'm a mighty man. Listen, listen, there was this whole group of men, disciples. Uh, They call them apostles. And and today, 2,000 years later, we're still reading what they wrote down. We're still following. We're still learning. We're still understanding about God. The entire world was changed. But who were they? They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were tradesmen. 
but they had a spiritual authority because they knew who they were and who God defined them to be. What you confess, you agree with. What you confess, you agree with it. I'm going to show you a scripture that might make more sense now than it did before you came here. It might just click in your mind why he said the way he said it in Matthew 10, 32. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. What is he saying? Your confession is that Jesus is Lord, he is King, he is Savior, he is Redeemer. And because of your confession, you come into agreement with Jesus who is in agreement with you before God. Heaven and earth have come into agreement as to your status before God. And he says, what's important is that you confess it, you say it. And by the way, By the way, speaking of scriptures and the word confess, could it be that we need to confess our sins so that we can come into agreement with God over what we need forgiveness for? I don't know, but if you're in a kingdom group, you're going to be talking about that this week. Whoo! So what keeps us from making a good confession? What keeps us from confessing the things that God says about us? I think a vast majority of the time, it's because of what we know about our past. It's because of the failures that I've had when he says, you're a mighty man. And I said, no, man, last time you tried me, I wasn't mighty at all. Maybe there were unrealized dreams. I I thought you were going to use me for this, God, and you didn't. So uh, I guess I have to come into agreement that I'm not who you said I was. And I think the number one source of why you're hearing that is called the accuser, Satan. I'm going to talk about Satan in your past, and you better buckle up. Because we're going to get into it in Revelation 12, 10, and 11. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. Christ has come now. I have all authority in heaven and on earth. For the accuser, that would be Satan, of our brethren has been thrown down. This is in reference in Revelation to Satan being cast out of heaven and thrown down to the earth. He, Satan, who accuses them before our God day and night. For years, I didn't understand what this was saying. Because for years, I thought Satan was standing before God saying, oh, you don't know the real story about Todd. You don't know what he did last night. Oh, I know what's on his heart. Uh, he is not the man you think he is, God. He is, he is not the one you should be using because he's actually very lazy. Uh, and he, he doesn't take seriously the things you... Why in the world would Satan be standing before God saying anything about me when God would know more about me than Satan would? That makes no sense. Satan is not standing before God accusing you to God. Satan is making accusations to you and about you in the presence of God. Before God, he is standing and saying, you are a failure. I just want you to know that you will never succeed because you are not good enough. You and your actions have disqualified you from ever being used by God. Your motives are wrong and they're manipulative. And you know what? You can't even hear from God. You're just fake and everything about you is a lie. Satan is accusing you in the presence of God. But listen. The answer to that problem is in the next scripture. And they overcame Satan because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their 
testimony and they did not love their life even when faced with death. The word of their testimony was about the blood of the lamb. Oh, stay with me. Why would it be so important that we confess the blood of the lamb? Because everything we confess about the blood of the lamb is a direct contradiction to what Satan is saying about us. Because of our testimony of Jesus, we cannot come into agreement with Satan. We are not coming into agreement with Satan's accusations. We are coming into agreement with what the blood of the Lamb accomplished. So my testimony is what the blood of the Lamb accomplished in my life. I will confess that with my mouth, what the blood of the lamb accomplished in my life and my testimony directly counteracts everything that Satan says. I'm coming into agreement that I'm saved by Jesus. I'm coming to an agreement that I'm forgiven by the blood of the lamb. I'm coming into agreement that I've been washed clean by that blood. I'm coming into agreement that I'm sealed for the day of redemption. I'm coming into an agreement that I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm coming into agreement my sins are not held against me. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Everybody say passed away. Behold, new things have come. Do you believe this scripture? Do you believe this scripture? Because if I were to stand here today and tell you that somebody in my life passed away, what would that mean to you? They died. They're gone. They don't exist here anymore. They're not around me. They are removed. They are gone. They're not coming back because they died and they are dead. Listen to me. Because of that, the old things in your life, they passed away. They died. They're not there anymore. They are dead and they don't exist. And your past failures don't exist. And your past attitudes don't exist. And your past sins don't exist anymore. And the only way, listen close, the only way that they can be revived in your life is if you confess with your mouth that they are still here and you come into agreement that they are still here. Oh, I'm about to get tough. I hope you're ready. So we say dumb things like, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, you are not. Do you realize when you confess that with your mouth, you are confessing that I am a sinner, but 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner, and yes, I'm saved by grace, but now I'm washed, and I'm sanctified, and I'm justified. But then let's talk about some of the things we confess about ourselves. Things like, I'll never be able to do that. Well, let's just come into agreement by confession on that, okay? I'll always struggle with my weight. Well, great. You just came into an agreement by your confession. I can't remember things like I used to. Good job. You just came into an agreement with it by your confession. I'm so stupid. Great. Now you've come into agreement with it by your confession. I'm an alcoholic. Oh, now you've come into agreement with it by your confession. My life is chaos. Yeah, you've come into agreement with chaos by your confession. I never hear from God. Good job. You just came into agreement with never hearing from God by your confession. Maybe we need to confess and come into agreement with things like this. I am free from the law of sin and death, Romans 8, 2. I have overcome fear in my life, Isaiah 54, 14. I have a peace that goes beyond my understanding, Philippians 4, 7. Whoa, hold on, here it goes. I am merciful and forgive quickly, 
Luke 6, 36 through 38. I have everything I need to fight the enemy. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. I am a work of God created to do good things. Ephesians 2, 20. There's a whole list of truths that define you in Scripture, and we need to begin coming into agreement with those things instead of the things that the enemy is accusing us of. Now, before I close on this subject, before you walk out of here saying, yeah, I'm not talking about the power of positive words or the power of positive thinking. I am not talking about mystical and magical use of words. I'm not even talking about name it and claim it. I'm saying that there is a biblically based power when you confess something, you come into agreement with God on that or you come into agreement with the enemy on that. There is a spiritual battle going on for what you're confessing. I want to show you a scripture that I'm going to bet you've never thought of this way. Romans, uh, Romans, Matthew 15, 18. Read this carefully with me. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And those defile the man. I don't want you to miss this. It did not say what's in your heart defiles you. It said the things that proceed out of the mouth are what defile you. They come from your heart, but it defiles you when it comes out of your mouth. Oh, I can struggle with things. I can, I, can, I can fight and wrestle in the spirit with things. But when I begin to declare things, the enemy hears what I declare. And all of a sudden, I'm coming into agreement with something, and it can defile me. Listen to me. You can be defiled by what you confess. And in the same way, you can be strengthened by a good confession. Stand to your feet, please. I'll ask my altar ministers to come forward. This is what we're doing this morning. I believe that as I have spoken to you today, you begin to make a checklist in your head. You know, I always say this about me, and I got to quit saying that. You know, I never say this about me, and I got to start saying that. Listen, I'm not interested in you feeling in any way demeaned by coming up and telling someone, oh my gosh, I'm going to be fat all my life. I don't think that's what we're here to do. What we're here to do is to make the confession that my body is the temple of the Lord and it will be healthy and whole. Maybe instead of saying, I just can't ever seem to succeed. Maybe we would say, my God makes all things possible and therefore I can succeed. I'm looking for your positive, your good confession. This is what I'm looking for you to do this morning because I believe there are people in this room who need to declare and confess aloud with their mouth the good confession of God. So I'm not asking you to come up here and say what you have negatively spoken over yourself. I'm asking you to confess to one of these altar ministers up here with your words, with your mouth, say it out loud. Here is my good confession. I am ready and willing to be used by God today. He has equipped me with every good armor that I need to do battle against me. I now can speak against the enemy. I refuse to believe the enemy's accusations. I'm going to believe what God says about me. It's time for you to confess with your mouth a good confession. So I'm going to pray and I'm going to invite you to come up. It doesn't have to be a long time. If you need prayer, stay for prayer. But if you just need to come up and make the confession that you know is true in scripture about you, that you need to begin confessing with your mouth, we're going to ask you to do that today. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we believe you know us better than we know us. And you know when we're mighty men and women. And you know that our future is strong and positive and the outlook is great. You know that we are not addicted to anything in this dark world. And we will declare and confess and come into agreement with you that I am a child of the living, loving God who has a plan and purpose, who takes care of me, who strengthens me, who equips me, who gets me ready for battle. And the battle is already won, so I'm headed toward a victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.